Anyway, I'm um, Senior Portfolio Manager at the Commission. I'm in charge of the Reducing Perioperative Harm Program, also uh, manage the Infection Prevention and Control Program and the Deteriorating Patient Program. Um, I work alongside my colleague who looks after um, the Medication Safety Program, um, the Reducing Harm from Falls Program and um, Pressure Injuries. So that is the sum of the quality improvement programs that the Commission has on the go at the moment, so very busy space. Um, in perioperative harm in New Zealand, where do we get our information from about what the current state is? I thought I'd um, just remind you that it's not just us um, you know, guessing what the environment is like at the moment. We look to our serious adverse event reports, um, we talk to our ACC colleagues, we get their data about the treatment related injury um, claims that they have. Uh, we look at the Health and Disability Commissioner complaints, um, and of course, we look at the um, national minimum data set. Um, we also have, of course, the Perioperative Mortality Review Committee, which is one of the functions of the Commission, um, and we look at um, data from the Health Round Table. And we don't just look internally, we look e externally and we um, compare against um, similar data that's collected um, OE across the OECD. This is a, what we call our um, case for change. I'm sure, or at least I hope, um, you've all seen this before. <coughs> Apologies for the busyness of the slide. This is available on our website, and um, if you want hard copies, we can send them to you, because we do find that um, putting this in front of people who are recalcitrant or naysayers, this really helps to get them on board um, to the types of quality improvement that we're talking about. Um, this also helps. This is a summary of the um, recent year's serious adverse event reports, um, specifically the perioperative harm ones. Um, just look at that retained item slash swab um, portion of the column. Um, and then also look at the wrong site portion of the column. Um, and if I go back to that, you can see um, on which way you're facing, on the right hand side, the OECD average there. Um, for accidental puncture or laceration during surgery, and then in, then in the middle, foreign bodies. This is a bit more detail about some of the most recent um, SAE uh, um, reports. Um, I'm sorry about the brevity of the summary. That's sometimes as much information as we get if we don't get fully completed Part Bs. But again, working through that list actually makes some quite sobering reading. And this isn't the entirety of the list um, I just wanted one slide, so I actually cut some out. So what can we do to stop this happening? Um, you've heard it all before, it's about having a safety culture, open, um, an open culture, being um, able to learn from mistakes. Um, it's about standardising um, some of our interventions, um, and specifically I am talking about briefing all three parts of the WHO surgical safety checklist and debriefing. Um, it's about engaging the team, improving teamwork and communication most especially. Um, it's about reporting events and learning from them. The Commission has put in a huge amount of effort in recent years to um, encourage people to submit their serious adverse event reports, even if there was no harm caused. Um, we want to hear about the near misses and um, celebrate the fact that there was no harm, but also still take the learnings that we can. Um, and tell stories, share the learnings across the sector. Uh, one of the things I hope to do um, as we roll out the um, next phase of the program is collect case studies from you all and find out what you did that worked well or um, you know, what was that massive barrier that after months and months you finally figured out um, the crucial thing that would make a change and put it up on our website or get you up on a um, podium presenting about it. There is lots of evidence. Um, most recent um, one has just come out only the other week. Uh, first ever randomised control trial of the checklist found a decrease in complication rates of 42% uh, um, and a reduction in the length of stay. I'm not going to read through all of that. Um, we do have on our website a summary of the evidence that we've used to build our case for why we are doing this work. And um, if you can't find it on our website, because I do agree there's lots of information and it can be a bit hard to navigate, just let us know and we'll send it out to you. And we can, you can use that as part of your um, package around convincing people of um, why these interventions are a good idea. Equally, there's evidence about um, briefing and debriefing, and you've just heard from Ian about that. So, a little bit of the history of the program. Um, we started with um, introduction of the checklist. Um, it was a modified version of the WHO surgical safety checklist, um, and 
of course, we had our quality, associated quality and safety marker. Apologies, this is actually uh, not the most recent um, quarter's data, and uh, Miranda would love it if I pointed out that Canterbury is now up in the green. Um, and I can also say that um, Auckland is uh, painted red because they are, um, when this data was collected, they were trying out their new approach, moving to the paperless model. Um, and the same for Waikato, they were part of our proof of concept project last year and that affected um, the quality of the data, or not the quality of the data, the results. Probably improved the quality of the data, made it more realistic, which is the point that I want to make next. I'm um, aware that our quality and safety marker has driven the wrong behaviour. It has driven that tick, 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 sign, put it in the patient notes, move on, um, sort of audit mentality. Um, you know, we are learning as we go along, so we recognise that that was not the most appropriate quality and safety marker. And so we are retiring it. I hope you've all had that message. Um, no more collecting of that data, no more auditing um, patient notes to be, have to submit that. Um, I am jumping ahead to my future slide, but um, don't worry. Um, uh, you will have a year off from reporting on that um, uh, QSM, where uh, reporting on any QSM, we're going to bring in a new one. Because we want a QSM that um, drives improvement in teamwork and communication. In 2012, we did a study. This was part of the sort of trying to establish the baseline for the project around attitudes to the checklist. Um, so this is a couple of years old now, and I do hope that attitudes have changed slightly, but I thought it was still a good idea to put it up. Uh, lack of understanding about the intent, not understood as being a tool to improve teamwork and communication, and I accept that we might have driven a little bit, of, we might have continued a little bit of that. Lack of clinical engagement and buy-in. Lack of local evidence of the benefits. Um, you can read that for yourself. So we ran a proof of concept project last year. We worked with um, one of the Southern Cross hospitals in Auckland um, and uh, Lakes and Waikato District Health Board. Um, Miranda mentioned that they have done quite a lot of um, the hard graft. We started out with 10. Um, teamwork and communication tools. She worked through the four that um, came out to be by far and away the best and the most usable. So that was the closed loop communication ISBAR. And I'm going to forget them now that I'm standing up on the podium. Normally I can rattle them off. Um, and we also uh, tested our rollout approach. And so a lot of the communications you've had from us about our plans for the next financial year have been um, based on the learnings from the proof of concept work. We have allowed as long a preparation period as we possibly can because the proof of concept sites um, fed back to us that we just there was just not enough time to prepare before they were in implementation phase. Um, so you, hopefully you will feel the benefits of that. Um, Another learning was the importance of clinical leadership, having uh, um, senior uh, members of the uh, clinical um, uh, directorate, uh, sorry, surgical directorate, but also having more senior members of um, the DHB on board with what you're trying to do. You know, ideally we'd like the chief, um, chief executives to champion this, so if you've got your recalcitrant surgeon or whatever, they can be referred to the chief executive. Um, also peer-to-peer -peer support, um, that's one of the um, key things that, that um, design um, points we've tried to include in our rollout. Um, we've created cohorts, we want the cohorts to work together, it's not so much about us um, dictating how things are done, um, we want you to learn from one another. Some of the DHBs are ahead, um, ADHB has had uh, paperless checklists for quite some time now in, in a lot of its theatres. We've got Lakes and Waikato who took part in the proof of concept. Um, we've got DHBs around the country who um, did teapot, which Steve mentioned, which is it's the same interventions. Um, we've done a quick check on where things are at with um, DHBs that did teapot, and for some it's been a it's long forgotten, but for others they've maintained it, so they could be um, provide some peer support on how um, they've managed to continue the work that Teapot started. Um, one thing that we have found is that um, the proof of concept sites found, found with, that with the introduction of briefing, it did result in enough efficiency gains that they were able to add um, extra procedures onto their list. It's not the point of the exercise, but it does tell you a little bit about um, you know, the benefits to be gained, the efficiency um, gains. So this again is a really busy slide, I'm sorry. I've only allowed myself 15 minutes. Um, so 
this is what you get when you've only got 15 minutes, busy slides. So a one year hiatus from having to report on a quality and safety marker, um, a phased rollout of briefing, debriefing, and the move to the paperless approach. Um, that's how the cohorts stand as of today. There's still a tiny amount of shuffling going on between cohorts two and three, um, but cohort one is, is pretty well established. Each DHB will receive targeted training on how to implement the changes during their cohort's preparation phase. We've actually um, designed a training package that we will roll out, we'll work with you to find out how and when um, the training should be delivered within um, certain time frames, um, and work with you to make sure that the right people on the ground have been trained in these new um, interventions. We're also, uh, over the course of the year, going to develop the new quality and safety marker. I know it would be great if we could do this work without the public reporting or the sort of added burden that collecting and reporting that data creates, but and sadly that we can't. It is a ministerial requirement. Um, we'll be doing a uh, train the trainer regarding uh, training local people to be able to observe the interventions being um, worked through so they can report on the levels of teamwork and engagement. Um, sort of modelled on uh, the hand hygiene observation, um, or observational audit approach. Um, and as part of the proof of concept, we designed an app, um, which means that you can enter and submit and review your own data um, real time. So we're hopeful that that is um, seen as enough of a reduction in the burden of the data collection and also uh, provides you with really useful information about how you're going, um, that, that you, um, you, you pick up the app and you uh, um, don't mind so much about reporting in to us about how you're going. So this is a summary of the rollout timeframes. Cohort one, uh, preparation period July, start of July till the end of September. In that time there will be a learning session, a cohort wide learning session. We'll bring everybody together to sort of a, an introductory um, session. Then there will be the intervention training DHB by DHB. And then by the end of that you should hopefully be ready to move to implementation phase. So it's only on 1 October that we would like the posters to go up on the theatre walls. In the build-up um, period, it's all about getting your local champions, getting your project plan, doing your communications, getting ready, making sure you're ready for, the, for that change. Um, and you can see the um, similar rollout timeframes for the other cohorts. We have treated December and January as kind of dead months, which is why you'll see the um, expanded timeframes there. Um, we are going to run webinars in between um, things like the learning sessions and the intervention training, optional for people to dial in and talk to one another about how things are going. Um, we will be sending out a how-to guide that will include this diagram plus a whole lot more information in it. Um, and I should also point out that we are working with the Private Hospitals Association and Southern Cross to make sure that the private hospitals um, get included in this. You'll get the same resources um, you'll get invited to the learning sessions, um, and we're hopeful that with the DHB um, intervention training, your partner or local DHB will invite you um, to attend. So we should get the spread across the two sectors, two parts of the sector. This is um, sort of a penultimate draft. I've actually got hard copy, copies up here covered in scribbles from um, quick quality assurance checks with Ian and Miranda this morning. So. These are not quite the final drafts, but our plan is um, that these will go up on theatre walls to guide the conversations. Um, there's the surgical safety checklist, and there's the um, brief debriefing. Um, we don't mind if you use your own versions. You know, we'll make ours available for people to put up on walls and use as much as they like. If you want more copies, all you have to do is let us know. Equally, if you've got your own local version, um, as long as it sort of meets a gold standard and, you know, there's not massive chunks missing, we, we honestly don't mind. It's about guiding the conversation and making sure that nothing is forgotten, make sure that, making sure that all team members um, are empowered to take part. Up on our website, we're going to put um, the ADHB versions. Equally, we don't mind if you prefer theirs to ours. We're also going to put the Southern Cross version. Equally, we don't mind. It's, it's um, the process rather than the, the poster itself that we care about. 
So options for support, um, we recognise this is quite a big shift. Um, we've already had messages that people are going to be really reluctant to give up the hard copy evidence that, you know, forevermore we can go back to the patient notes and say, see that the checklist was done. Whether it was done well is another question. Um, so we want to give you lots of support. Um, we've planned the learning sessions, the webinars, the training and the rollout, but there are other ways that you can get support. You could have Ian or Miranda come to visit your DHB and talk at a grand round or come and talk specifically to a team. Um, you can talk to the Commission Quality Improvement Advisors about what to do with the data that you're seeing as you um, report it into the app. There's lots of information available on our website. Um, what we'd love to see happen is if DHB to DHB connections happen, you know, if we get the message out that DHB X has made major um, ground and other DHBs want to learn directly from them, that would be a happy day for me. Um, and of course, I have an open inbox policy, so there's my contact details and my phone number, so f f feel free to give me a call. And that's that. Are there any questions? Is it stunned silence, or is it... Okay, question. We got a microphone? Okay. Um, so the question was, if we don't have a hard copy of the checklist, how do we prove that it was done? I'm not aware of any um, standard of care that specifies, um, national standard of care that specifies that there has to be a hard copy of a checklist. I know that some DHBs have built it into their own systems, and I have absolutely no problem with people continuing to do a hard copy, but Ian's going to add to that. No, well, I, I think the, the whole object of this is to make it business as usual and say that um, the, the, the expectation is that the checklist was done because you wouldn't have done an operation without it being done. The piece of paper that we've had previously has got no more relevance to whether the checklist was done than a consent form signed without discussion with the patient. It, it, is, it is a piece of paper which has no value. And I reflect on the fact that I used to think that consent forms were of some value. And, and many years ago when I did my fellowship in the US at the Cleveland Clinic, I was somewhat surprised to learn and find out that they didn't actually, at that point in time, anyway, have consent forms. They actually required the treating doctor to actually have a discussion with the patient. Pretty radical thought there. Um, and, and, and like most things, that, that to, to write that they had had that discussion. Now, whether there should be something in the notes, either in the anaesthetic record or the surgical record, to imply that the checklist was done, I'm, I'm open to that discussion, but in terms of a standardised form with ticks in the box and somebody signing at the bottom, I, 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 I'm often reminded, of course, by our aviation colleague who's on the Health Quality and Safety Commission that there's no signed form in the, uh, in the cockpit of the airline that, uh, flight that I'll take back to Wellington tonight, but it would be business as usual that they will do a checklist and I think that's the goal that we should aspire to rather than having a piece of paper with people signed on so we know who to blame if things don't get right but we actually doesn't encourage us to necessarily do the right thing at the time. So I, I was, Ian's reinforced what I was going to say, I have no problem with people continuing to use the hard copy, it's just that's not what we want to do and I would suggest you'd find that quite burdensome quite quickly and maybe a one line in patient note somewhere was the checklist done would cover that but yeah I think Ian answered that really well anything else great thank you very much so